I would love to start by reading 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 4, and then 1 Corinthians, sorry, 1 Timothy 4, 1 to 4, if you'd like to turn in your Bibles, and then after that, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I will just say while people are turning, it is interesting to me that I get, when I passed the age of 60, I got invited to speak about sex over and over again. I think the hypothesis is, you know, if you're over 60, it's safe. If you're under 60 and you're attractive, it's a problem. If you're, uh, if you're under 40, it's definitely a problem. And if you're under 40 and you're not attractive, that's a different problem. It's a problem. But when you're above 60, it's sort of like nobody cares anymore. So you can just talk away about these matters. First Timothy chapter 4 starts off a little bit strangely to our ears. It says, now the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons. We're ready for something really terrible coming through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. And what do they do? What's their terrible teaching? They forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. So God created our, our sexuality. It's like all things God created, it is good and should not be rejected, should be received with thanksgiving. The second passage is a corrective, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 and following. Paul corrects the Corinthians who have a mistake in their minds from the culture they were in, which was, as many of you would probably know, a corrupt culture, a Greco-Roman culture with massive flaws. And Paul says to them that he wants to correct the errors of their culture. Now, it shows up in a quotation mark, which is almost certainly what they wrote to Paul. Paul says explicitly in chapter 7 that he's aware that they wrote him a letter. He's going to answer that letter, but it seems he starts answering it a little bit earlier when he has this comment from them, all things are lawful for me. He replies, but not all things are helpful or edifying or beneficial. It could be translated. All things are lawful for me, say the Corinthians. Paul says, but I will not be enslaved by anything. There's a play on words in the Greek here, lawful and enslaved enslaved sound kind of similar to each other. We might say, um, it could maybe be translated like this, um, all things are under my authority, but I will not live under the authority of anything. Verse 13, food is made for the stomach and the stomach for foods, and God will destroy both one and the other. Furthermore, the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. At the end, he comments and says this, or do you not know, verse 19, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God with your body. And at the end of the passage, the passage actually runs all the way from 612 to 1031. It's all one very long unit. You know the Bible chapter divisions are man-made and they've had all kinds of divisions over the years. Um, But the unit does come to an end, this, this, this discussion of how we use our freedom, using freedom to the glory of God. It ends with verse 31, so whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And that would, of course, include our sexuality. Let's pray for a moment. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for the gift of sexuality, male and female, for the gift of, of procreation, of husband and wife coming together. And I pray that in our culture, in our day, in our lives, we would affirm this and glorify you and thank you and not reject this, your good gift. And we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. So at the simplest level, I want to say to you, God created sex and it's good. It's part of his good plan. God could have made the world differently. Humans could have reproduce the way all kinds of organisms reproduce, you know, through shooting out spores or by parthenogenesis or meiosis and mitosis and other biological terms you can't remember the meaning of, but it has something to do with, with reproduction. God could have done it any number of ways. 
And God furthermore says that, incredible as it may seem to us at first glance, that the self-giving mutual love and admiration of husband and wife in some measure reflects the love between Christ and his church, the self-giving sacrificial love between Christ and the church. And, and again, it's all to the glory of God. Now, our culture doesn't hear this. And I want to just walk through some, uh, a few relatively safe events in our culture in the last 12 years or so. There was a movie that got a number of awards called The Green Knight that came out about 10 months ago. It's a retelling of the story. Anybody here see it by any chance? The critics loved it, therefore the people, ordinary people, did not love it. But it's, it's a retelling of one of the oldest stories in the English language, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. And Sir Gawain is, you know, it's from the days of King Arthur, a thousand years ago, therefore Gawain is a virtuous young knight originally. He goes on a quest, and the quest's point is to prove his virtue, his steadfastness, his courage, his resistance to temptations, and his fulfillment of a sacred duty. That's for a thousand years. Uh, retelling in 2021, the first scene, Gawain is in a brothel. So that's what you call reversal. We go from a, a virtuous knight to someone who's introduced as non-virtuous in the very first frame of the movie. And he's with a woman there whom he later impregnates and abandons for better prospects as a young uh, nobleman. So that's story one. There's also two stories I'm going to ask you probably, if many of you have probably at least heard of Parks and Recreation, a TV show, won all kinds of awards. It ended about nine years ago by now. And then a, a, a program from the same period of time and had some similarities called Chuck, not as well known, got some minor awards as well. They both had, uh, they were both growth of character programs. They both lasted five or six years and they started with um, self-absorbed, immature, young adults who changed, who grew. It's kind of the antithesis of Seinfeld in which nobody ever learned anything and that was the point of the show. Nobody was one iota more mature after nine years than the day they started. And that was the purpose, that was the meta purpose of the show. Nobody learns anything. And these shows were, after a fashion, responses to that. And in all these programs, the people matured, took on responsibility, learned to live for others, learned to form teams, and almost everybody started single and then ended up married. But the way they got married was American style. So these are virtue programs that were actually critiqued by social critics for being too virtuous, too in interested in uh, character. So Chuck begins with a, a computer genius geek nerd who accidentally becomes a spy and he has a beautiful handler who's his fake girlfriend for two or three years and then she becomes his real girlfriend. And everybody else, in the, they get married-ish and then everybody else does too. But the, the, the flow of their relationship goes like this. First, you, you're attracted. Then you go to bed together. Then you say, I love you. Then you move in together then you get engaged, then you get married. All the relationships, multiple relationships. Exactly the same, almost exactly the same with Parks and Recreation. Attraction, sex, I love you, move in, engaged, married. That's the cycle of virtue according to our entertainment industry right now. Now there's something else happening in our culture today, I'm going to say especially culture, the culture of educated people, which, you know, is probably most of the, I mean, you came, came for a conference on Friday and Saturday, so we know who we are here, right? We're, we're more educated, cerebral people. Among educated people, it's, it's been uh, very well documented by a Christian scholar, for example, named Mark Regneris, and he says, marriage has become in the West, among educated people, a capstone event instead of a foundational event. By a foundational event, we mean you get married when you're 18 or 24 or something like that, and you build a life together. You have nothing at the start. You don't even exactly know who you are, and then you create a life. You, go through, you finish your schooling, and you get your uh, early career going, and you, you, know, you buy a car that costs $2,200, and you have babies way before you should, 
and you create a life. And then by the age of 35, you, you realize, oh, we're, we've, we've gotten somewhere together. Now, that's, that's the model that, you know, prevailed, let's say, 50 years ago and 30 years ago and so forth. And it's still around a little bit. But the main model today is first you finish your training, get a college degree, maybe a master's, maybe a PhD. You get your degree. You get yourself started in your career. You create a, a, a bank balance. Uh, you can get a down payment for a house. And then around the age of 28, 29, you start looking to get married. And, and maybe you get married on average right now today, 30, 31 for women, 32, 30, getting toward 33 for men. That doesn't mean there have been no relationships. During this time, there have been relationships. Um, but the relationships go like this. You know, uh, 17, 18, 19, 20 years old, you have your first um, sexual encounter with somebody, and you keep it light, you make it clear, this is just temporary, and you might live with somebody a little bit. It might be by design, it might be by accident. And you run through a series of let's not anybody get hurt relationships while you figure out who you are. There is a strong aversion to get married quickly. Now, this doesn't work. People who study these matters in the Bible understand that it violates God's plan, but people who study it, psychologists and sociologists and historians, have said over and over and over again that when people say, let's, you know, let's experiment around, live with a few people, and then when I find the right one, I'll get married, and you never would want to get married to anybody before you live with them a while to see if you're compatible. People who do this are far more likely to get a divorce than those who simply get married. And the reason's fairly straightforward, and it is that people learn to be in a lightly committed, easy in, easy out relationship. And it's not as though you can turn that off the minute you get married. So uh, people are pursuing, they, they say they're pursuing safety, but they're actually pursuing danger when they go at their physical life, their sexual life, their marital life that way. Now, pe some people say, well, you know, at least we can, you know, flourish or have lots of experiences sexually. What's very interesting is that statistically speaking, people who are married have much stronger, better, more regular, enjoyable sex lives than those who are, you know, no matter how gorgeous they are, single people. I'll say more about that in a little while. The most, the most basic thing I can tell you is, Life works when we go with the grain of reality, which is the way God created things. And the way it works, the way God made us to work physically and sexually is to give ourselves to each other totally and absolutely with unconditional love. And that unconditional love and self-giving is, is the context in which people have a good sex life. What's interesting is that people, secular people, secular feminists, are now starting to say the same thing. They're saying, whatever we've been doing for the last 50 years, it hasn't been working. David French, you know him, he's a Christian, sort of out in the, you know, the blogosphere that is a Christian lawyer and, and thinker that secular people respect for a variety of reasons. And he's written several pieces very recently quoting secular feminists who say, the hookup culture is bad for women. The pornification of society is bad for women. It's degrading. It makes people want to reenact. I, I, I don't want to, I hate to say this, but I'm going to say it. It makes people want to reenact what they've seen in the world of pornography. And it's degrading and humiliating and, and brutal. And, and so the question is, um, where do you find, and especially women, where do women find themselves ready to have and pleased to have a great sex life? And, and one of the best answers to this is when they know they receive unconditional love and committed love. Now, where do you get unconditional love and affirmation? Well, you know, you could say, uh, my husband or my boyfriend will really love me if I look fantastic. I can go to the gym and I'll look great. And I'll, I'll get a diet and I'll, you know, look and so fantastic, he would never want to look at anybody else. Um, the, the problem is nobody's perfect. And very, very few people can, can craft a perfect body at the gym. So um, I'll just say it this way. Uh, my body's in pretty good shape for my age group, but I have grandchildren who live in the neighborhood. Uh, all my grandchildren 
decided to live in my hometown, St. Louis, and so their parents had no chance, but the, no choice but to follow suit, which I found very delightful. And so we do things like go swimming together, and my granddaughter goes swimming with me, and you know, it's very physical. We, we swim and we throw each other around, and then she's, you know, but she's not admiring my buff body. She's saying things like, Papa, what happened to your hair in the back? And Papa, why do you have red dots on your bo- uh, Why do you have red dots on your tummy? And I go, well, because my mother had red dots in her tummy. What can I do? You know, it's it's genetic. Believe it or not, you may have red dots on your tummy someday, and you'll wonder where they came from, also. But there we are. We're all imperfect. Um, the best setting for a good sex life is unconditional love. It's not by having a perfect body, it's by having a husband who says, I love you as you are. That's where people find themselves able to have the self-giving of marriage. To say it another way, statistics indicate over and over again that although, as one author put it, these should be boom times for sex, that's a quotation, because of dating apps and and sexually transmitted diseases are down and, and so forth, and and moral standards are very loose. It should be boom times for sex, but by every conceivable measure, pun intended, by every conceivable measure, sexual activity is down in America. People are becoming sexually active later. They're less sexually active in college. There are more and more people who, who never marry and never are intimate with anybody in their entire life. Uh, Japan is viewed as as a bellwether. Uh, because they're ahead of us, if you will, in so many ways. 43% of of all adults under the age of 34 in Japan, 43% are virgins right now. And there are innumerable marriages where people have given up on sex. So the church, of course, is reluctant to speak about sex because we think, you know, nobody wants to hear what we have to say. And there's a sense in which that's true and also a sense in which it isn't true Um, That is to say, if you just declare, you know, you're all sinful, nobody wants to hear that. But if you say there's a better way, and you describe God's way, then people do have an interest in hearing that because they're beginning to sense that something has gone wrong. So what has gone wrong is that we've left God's design for marriage and sexuality. And we therefore lose our joy and his glory. Specifically, God ordained Sex and marriage to go together, and we've separated it. God ordained sex and procreation to go together, and we've separated it. God ordained our sexuality to bring people closer together, but we've made sex into a commodity. We've also told ourselves that any desire we have, we should indulge in, and so we've run amok. So what are we going to do? I'm going to give you four ideas for those of you who like to take notes, and even if you don't like notes, I'm going to give you four ideas. So four things very quickly, and this is not the outline of the whole talk, just four points right away. Number one, we confess. Confess our our personal sin. Confess that we've gone our way. Tell the truth about how we've gone wrong. Number two, we proclaim. We proclaim that God designed people to give themselves to each other wholly, body, soul, mind, and strength, not just give the body. As people, people talk a lot about casual sex. There is no such thing. As one theologian said, you cannot take your body into the bedroom and park your soul at the door. There is no such a thing as casual sex. So we proclaim that self-giving heart and mind and body go together. Number one, we confess our sins. Number two, Everything goes together. Number three, when we get married, we persevere. Number three is we, we persevere. We live together. We persevere in the life. By that, I mean not just that one by one we persevere. I mean that we resolve to help each other in our marriages. I also mean that we invite people into our homes, the many, many people who've had broken lives, broken, their parents were divorced, their friends were divorced, brothers and sisters were divorced. They've never seen a good well-functioning family. You just invite people into your house. The house does not have to be perfect. You can be serving leftovers. My wife started off as entertainment model, and she, we together willfully abandoned that a number of years ago. And if you want to come to our house, you just come to our house. In fact, 
tonight there's multiple people coming to our house because my wife doesn't want to be alone and who knows what they're going to eat, but you know, they're going to be together and they're going to talk about ministry and about marriage and so forth. And, and I've, when we have people to our home, my wife just says, here, cut these vegetables. And a woman will say like a week later, that's the first time I ever held a knife in my hand in the kitchen because my mother and dad never cooked anything. I never saw anybody prepare a meal. And another time, when this is a number of years ago, one of our kids misbehaved and it was quite clear what she had done. I have three daughters, no sons. And so uh, I said, I, you know, I said, um, Matilda, not her name, I don't want to reveal who it was, uh, Matilda, <laughs> and I just gave her a little finger wag and we went away and we came back. And, and the couple said, we've never seen that before. We have never seen quiet discipline of a child. Neither one of us ever saw it a single time. It was either neglecting or it was screaming and hitting, one or the other. Never anything, never anything healthy. So thanks for letting us see that. And you know, we're, we're, I'm thinking that they had no idea what went on, of course. But we, we live, so we confess, we proclaim, we live, and we speak well of marriage. There's a book by a man named John Kleinig, who's a, an orthodox, Bible-believing, gospel-believing uh, Lutheran who lives in Australia, and it's called Wonderfully Made, and he says, many wonderful things, but one of them is we have to start talking about holy matrimony again. People used to say holy matrimony. Nobody ever says that anymore. Let's talk about the fact that marriage is holy and beautiful and good and consecrated. It's a noble thing. And it has noble ideals. Not a lot of rules, he said. You know, actually, if you look at the Bible, there are very few rules about how to conduct yourself in marriage. You know, don't deprive one another, love one another, give sacrificial to each other. That's about it. That's not a lot, a lot of rules. But the main idea is it's holy and it's good. Now, the Bible tells us how to live in a, in a holy manner. It doesn't do it by way of command. So um, there are very few commands about sex in the Bible. The Bible doesn't command romantic love. It commends romantic love. By that I mean... I mean that God put in us a drive, a drive to get married, to have a physical intimacy, husband and wife, to have children, and, then, and God blesses that. And we see that in a variety of places. We see it, for example, in the Song of Songs, sometimes called Song of Solomon, but I think Song of Songs is probably a better title. And in the Song of Songs, you notice how the husband and the wife, soon to be, have eyes for each other, and they desire each other openly. Oh, that you would kiss me with the kisses of your mouth, she says in one place. And, and she's full of ideas of kissing and touching, and, and they look at each other, and they look at each other in a way that either uh, describes what it means to be in love or reminds you of what it means to be in love. If you kind of forgot, let me read to you from Song of Songs 4, 1 to 7. 4, 1 to 7. I'm gonna, we'll be in, in Song of Songs for five minutes. Or so, if you want to turn, we'll also be in chapter 8. So it says this. Uh, this is the man. We'll read the woman admiring her husband to be in a moment. It says, uh, 4, 1 to 7. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. So there we go. That's a good start. Your eyes behind your veils are doves. Now, we don't know what that means, but maybe dark, luminous eyes. Doves have lovely eyes. Your hair is like a flock of goats. Now, you might not consider that to be a, a compliment at first, but it probably means her hair is blonde and curly, and he likes that. Uh, your teeth are like a flock of sheep just shorn coming up from the washing. We understand that means her teeth are white, not black, not dead. Um, each has its twin, not one of them is alone. This is not something to be assumed in the days before dentistry. It means when she smiles, there are no gaps. They're all there, right? Your neck... Sorry, your mouth is lovely. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built with elegance. On it hang a thousand shields, shields of warriors. Probably means she's got jewelry that, that um, enhances her beauty. Your two breasts are like two fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle that browse among the lilies. All beautiful you are, my darling. There is no flaw in you. Now, honestly, I don't know how breasts browse among lilies. I really don't know what that means. But he thinks it's awesome. And... And we're supposed to think it's, it's good also. And the main idea is absolutely clear, and that is you are beautiful. 
and there is no flaw in you, and I think to myself, I've never seen a person with no flaws. It, everybody has flaws, but for the, for the eye of the beloved, there is no flaw. So, you know, in my age group, I look around at my friends' wives, and I think, boy, they look old. And I look at my wife, and I think, man, she looks young. I, they probably think the same thing when they look, look at my wife. I don't know what's wrong with them when they don't see how she's hardly aged at all over the years. But that's how it seems to me. The idea is there is one person in all this world whom I desire, my beloved, my husband, my wife. And the woman says something similar in chapter 8. She says, my beloved, uh, sorry, chapter, I said chapter 8, chapter 5, there's chapter 8 in a minute. Chapter 5, my beloved is radiant and ruddy, distinguished among 10,000. He's the best looking guy in 10,000 men. That's 510. His head is like the finest gold. His locks are wavy, black as a raven. His eyes are like doves, so they have similar eyes. His cheeks are like beds of spices, mounds of sweet-smelling herbs. His lips are lilies. You know, it doesn't sound very masculine, I guess, but she thinks it's pretty good. Lip... Lips are dripping liquid myrrh. His arms are like rods of gold set with jewels. His body's like polished ivory. His legs are like alabaster columns. He's really strong. She thinks it's awesome. His mouth is most sweet. He's altogether desirable. This is my beloved, and this is my friend. And so they look at each other with the kind and loving eye of love. Now, you know, over in Psalm 137, 119, verse 37, it says, the, the prayer is, turn my eyes from worthless things. Turn my eyes from worthless things. So where should we turn our eyes? Well, not toward idols, not toward other women or other men, but turn our eyes toward what is good, the admiration of my husband, the admiration of my wife. The, with, with the idea, marriage, sexuality, reproduction, it's all together, and it's, it's earnestly felt This is right before they get married, and in chapter 8, she says she wants to, you know, embrace and kiss her husband-to-be in public, and so she says, oh, I wish that you were a brother to me so I could kiss you outside and none would despise me because you're just so attractive. But then she also says, "I, I need to control myself. She says, do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. So we get to rein in our sexuality until we're married. So I just want to pause to apply a little bit and say, first of all, that if you're single here, um, don't give up. This is still God's plan. Even if you're 44, 53, or 23, whatever age you might be, don't give up on romantic love, number one. Number two, if you're married, rekindle, tell your spouse, tell your husband, tell your wife about the beauty that you see in him or her. Admire, make lists. Give them lists of things you love or admire about your spouse. I've been doing this off and on for years. I, you know, this is mostly a male group. So come up with a list of at least 10, maybe 20 things you admire about your spouse and give it to her. See what she says. When I've handed these, this assignment out, I've handed it out to my students at times, and they've said... Um, Hey, Dr. D, I came up with a list of a thousand. One guy came up with a thousand. He must have been admiring her left pinky and right pinky and so forth. I don't know what he was doing, but he came up with a thousand. But then somebody else one time in a, in a fit of honesty said, come up with 10 reasons why I love my wife. It'd be easier to come up with 10 reasons why I hate her. Now, he was being honest. So treasure what is beautiful in your spouse. That's, that's what the Bible is telling us. And don't give up on your sexual life. There's a man named Richard Zeitner who said, I'm going to quote him here for a minute. He said, sexuality is an emotional and personal phenomenon that lies at the heart of the intimate marriage. Even for couples who agree to eliminate sexuality from their relationship, even in these couples, its absence reflects significant limitations in closeness and frequently negative feelings about oneself and the physical body. Conflicts often abound even when the ejection of sexuality from the relationship has been agreed upon as a solution to, he's a psychologist, attenuated intimacy and anxiety in the relationship. 
Now, if you, in case you're wondering, he, it's actually much more technical than that. But what he's saying is statistics show that if you abandon physical intimacy, it causes other problems. Husband and wife come together. Look, uh, sex in marriage brings the couple together. And when a couple drifts apart, physical intimacy as an act of love, devotion, and a following of God's good plan brings people back together, even if, it, you know, even if they don't necessarily feel like it in every way at the moment. That's partly what's behind, uh, you know, don't defraud each other, right? So he's encouraging us, shall we say, to enjoy, but also to discipline ourselves to enjoy what God tells us to enjoy. Even if you think it's just not working right now, it's messy, it's, it's unhappy, we're not happy in our marriage life together. And this is all a part of, of the world of affection. In, in the, again, in the song of songs, one more time, you know, the, the woman says things like, if you find, oh, daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you, if, it fi- if you find my beloved, what will you tell him? Tell him I am faint with love. And then, and then that happens three times. Three times, almost exact same wording. And three times, it also says, I am my lover's and my lover is mine. And over in Proverbs, the same thing. There's a warning in Proverbs 5 and 6 about the adulterous and about promiscuity and about sex gone amok, adultery. And it mentions flattery and um, lips drinking honey and the way is death. But the solution to promiscuity is not abstinence or asceticism. The solution is love and marriage. So the way that's described goes like this. It's metaphorical. It says, drink water from your own cistern, running water from your own well. Should your springs overflow in the streets, your streams of water in the public squares, let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. May your fountain be blessed. Rejoice in the wife of your youth, a loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be captivated by her love. Now, we understand this water... How many of you have been to Israel? Anybody here been to Israel? A few people have been to Israel. You know, it's a dry country. It's kind of like if you have been, it's not as dry as Arizona. It's dry kind of like Colorado, right? Or like not as dry as southern Utah, but maybe as dry as northern Utah, if that helps at all. I can see from your faces it does not help. (laughs) It's not the driest place in the world, but it's pretty dry. And you have to treasure up your water. And so our sexual potencies which are described as springs of water, should not be shared. You don't squander it. There's not a lot of this. It's a treasure. And so you devote your spouse, devote yourself to your spouse. And it also says specifically that may her breast satisfy you, may ever be captivated by her love. The word captivated, um, the Hebrew word is shigah, which ordinarily means to be drunk. May you be drunk with love. May you be intoxicated with love which we understand is not, the Bible never advocates literal drunkenness, but we understand what it is to be captivated or swept away by something, don't we? For those of you who have been involved in competitive sports, you know that in the middle of a contest, you get swept up, swept away, and and, and there's nothing, you know, when you're playing really well, the world is moving slowly, and the ball is gigantic, right? Anybody know what I'm talking about? The hoop is this big when you're playing basketball, everything's going well. And if you're playing, playing I'm a tennis guy, and if if everything's going well, no matter, if the ball's coming at you 104 miles an hour, it's slow. It's just big and fat and slow because you're just totally immersed. And if somebody walked up to you and said, excuse me, sir, what is your name in the middle of the match? You'd go, uh, give me a second here, I'm playing my sport. Or, you know. Any task you really love, when you love your work, some of you love your work, and you're caught up in the very best creative activities, you're completely captivated by it. Maybe you wake, sort of wake up and you say, oh my goodness, my stomach hurts. Why does my stomach hurt? Because I forgot to eat lunch. It's, oh, it's 3.30. I forgot to eat lunch because I was just so caught up. That's the idea, to be caught up with your spouse in, in blessed self-forgetfulness, to be carried away by love. Thomas Aquinas, have you heard of him? Thomas Aquinas said that 
sexuality is always evil because it produces an excess of pleasure that keeps the mind from contemplating God. Now, Aquinas was a monk, and so I've always wondered how he came to this conclusion. But I think we, you know, I think he's right that certain things lend themselves to multitasking and, you know, theological reflection and being with your spouse is not one of those things that kind of lends itself to multitasking, right? But that doesn't mean it's evil. He's right and he's wrong. He's wrong, he's right, that it, it doesn't lend itself to multitasking. He's wrong that that makes it evil because God created sex and he said, I... I want you to enjoy yourselves and procreate, and this is how I want you to do it. And so we can be caught up in it. The the Puritans, who, you know, came along 500 years later, 400 years later or so from Aquinas, um, don't look up the dates, it's actually more than 430 years, but just forgive me um, for this, affirmed that marriage is good and sexuality is good, and they actually often quoted the passage I read first, 1 Timothy 4, 1 to 4, and they said, this is a good gift of God and you should enjoy it and, and thank God for it, should not reject it. And you know, honestly, if your sex life is not great, they said your marital pleasures aren't great, pray about it. Tell God about it. Tell God about your sexuality. He knows anyway. And to some people, that sounds like a very strange idea. And, and so they're absolutely right about that. All right, so the goal in marriage then is whatever you do, eat, drink, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. How do we do that? And the good news is God has spoken to us and we don't, oh, look at that. (laughs) Man. You're going to have to cut this out of the little CD though. Um, Is anybody happy now the sun's not blistering their eyes? Yep. All right, good. Okay, so uh, what do we do? We, we go to the Bible. The Bible has told us how we should live our lives. Uh, God created sexuality. God created procreation. God created us to be married, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. That's what he said. I'm going to talk about that more tonight at, at uh, 7 o'clock, so I'll, I'll hold that uh, to some extent. But this is God's plan. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Keep your eyes on your wife or your husband. Admire your husband or your wife. Don't focus on their flaws, the little red spots. Focus on their excellence. Oh, how beautiful you are. Oh, my darling, there's no flaw in you. Admire and love and get caught up and express affection and rekindle affection. Give yourselves to each other, heart, soul, mind, and strength. Body, mind, will, emotions, the whole thing. That's the plan. It's, it's really quite simple. It's quite simple. Just don't quit. And don't get addicted to images of perfection that are unrealistic. They'll ruin you. Admire your spouse, not people that you see out and about or see people you see on a, a, in two dimensions, wherever the two dimensions might be. Now, in all of this, of course, we're supposed to live a life of love. Love one another as Christ loved us. And husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church which then is a further point, and that is that sexuality is connected to marriage. So that, you know, believe it or not, they've done studies. And I don't have the study here in front of me right now, but this, the gist of the studies goes like this. If, if you have um, small children and the husband puts the kids to bed twice a week, um, marital happiness and longevity and sex life improves like 6%. And if you do the dishes, you get another 4%. And if you scrub the kitchen floor, you get another 3%. And if you bring your wife coffee in the morning, you get another 2%. And some people say, wow, that makes perfect sense. This is fantastic. I'm going to do these little acts of love for my wife and, and to show her that I love her. And to be honest, I've been bringing my wife coffee for 30 years in the morning, like five, six days a week. She, you know, all I have to do is press a button. She puts it in there, you know, at 9.30 at night, and I bring her coffee. And every morning she says the same thing. She says, oh, thank you. And some people think that's beautiful. Other people think I, do, I have to do the dishes, put the kids to bed, bring coffee, and mop the floor, and all I get is 21 extra percent. Forget about it. I shouldn't have gotten laughter at that. That's, a bad, that's bad laughter. It's realistic laughter, though. All right, so the point, of course, is that it all hangs together. And 
and when, when you think to yourself things like, um, you know, oh, you're the lecturer, you're supposed to talk about marriage in this way as if everything is beautiful. Um, I've already told you I have red spots on my body and I could turn around and show you how I'm bald in the back of my head and so forth and we all have all these flaws but, you know, it goes beyond being bald or red spots or having dry skin or whatever it is that's wrong with you. Um, it's deeper than that. The flaws are deeper than, than the skin. They have to do with, you know, our character. And some, sometimes, you know, when we're exhausted, we're irritable, and then we can say, that's not the real me, right? But then we have other faults that are the real me, and I can't blame it on the fact that I didn't sleep enough last night. So I'll just tell you one. It's not a big, dark one, but it's one that drives my beloved wife a little bit crazy from time to time, and that is when I'm working on a lecture, trying to write something, I write books, um, I tend to wander around the house and I tend to wander around the house like maybe nibbling on an apple. And I'll just walk around the house and just say, oh good, you're downstairs. I wanna ask you, no, 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 don't talk to me. I'm, I'm working on a really difficult problem right now. She goes, you don't look like you're working on a difficult problem. You look like you're wandering around the house nibbling on an apple. I say, well, okay. I'm going outside now, I'm gonna pull some weeds. You're pulling weeds and you can't talk to me? Well, you know, I'm gonna pull weeds while I think about it. It's gonna help me think about it. That has happened hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times in my marriage. She still doesn't like it. But she loves me and I hope that I love her even though she has some idiosyncrasies which I will keep between me and her because you're not supposed to say unkind things about your spouse in public. Now, another way to talk about all this is to dis draw distinction. This is a, these are terms, I'm going to give you two terms that are not in the Bible, but I think they're excellent theological summaries of what is in the Bible. And the terms are accepting love and transforming love. Accepting love and transforming love. Accepting love is the love that God has for us. God loved us when we were still weak, Romans 5. God loved us when we were still sinners, Romans 5. God accepts us as we are. He loved us with a sovereign and free love that has no reference to any merit that's within us. He accepts us as we are. Transforming love is what we would call to, in theological terms, sanctifying love. That is the love that helps us become a better person. So accepting love says I love you as you are flaws and all. Transforming love says I love you too much to leave you in all of your flaws. And God's love has both, right? He justifies us. He loves us as we are sinners. And then he sanctifies us. He doesn't leave us unchanged. So, uh, Jesus demonstrates his, now I'm the one that's blinded by these things, sorry. I'm happy you're all doing better, but I wasn't. So um, Jesus showed accepting love in all kinds of ways, like he would spend time with tax collectors and sinners of all sorts, right? Accept them as they are. But then he would also say things like, go and sin no more. Accepting love and transforming love. Now, accepting love without any transforming love is negligent and indifferent and careless. But if all you have is transforming love, then you're judgmental and nagging all the time. We need transforming love and accepting love, and in the best marriages, we find both. I love you as you are, and I want you to be the best version of yourself. And that's what keeps a marriage strong. Another way to say it is, the Bible, in a variety of ways, points out that the most important thing you can do is get your loves right. So in 2 Timothy 3, a passage that almost no one pays any attention, I've never heard a sermon on it, uh, but it's an extremely important passage for what it says about loves. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, verse 1 and following, I'm going to ask you to turn if you would, uh, describes the, how important it is to get love right in the negative. It's a negative description about love. and It says this, in the last days will come times of difficulty for people will be. And then we get a list of vices. Lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving the good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, 
lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Now, I don't know what you notice in this list, and I'll, I see a bookseller back there, so I, I did write a commentary on 2 Timothy, and I, I had the pleasure of going through this list. But if you look at this list, it looks like a random list of terrible things people do. But if you look at it more carefully, it's a list that starts and ends with false loves. Look at it. It starts with lovers of self, lovers of money. Everything flows from that. And then the conclusion is lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Two comments about false love, two comments about false love start and end with the hint what you should do is love God and these other problems will go away. Get your loves right is what Paul is saying. Get your loves right in your marriage. Love your spouse as he or she is and, and also help them be the best person they can be. So you love them as they are and you help them become a little bit more lovable while making it clear there's still unconditional love. It's not always easy to do, but that's the formula. Now I want to look at one other passage. We have a little bit of time left, not a great deal of time. And that passage I want to look at again actually is 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. As I mentioned, uh, this is a, a unit that goes from 612 to 1031. And it starts with questions. And the big question throughout this entire passage is how much freedom do I have and how much can, my, can I indulge my freedoms. Specifically, they're asking, can I indulge myself with a prostitute, 1 Corinthians chapter 6? Can I divorce my wife or husband if, this is chapter 7 now, if they don't share my values? Can I eat meat that's been sacrificed to idols, chapter 8? Chapter 9 has its own questions about freedom. We have a lot of freedom, but Paul says, you've got to use your freedom in a way that's edifying, that's beneficial. So, are you free to drink coffee? Who's free to drink coffee? And what happens if you drink five cups of coffee a day? You become an addict. If you wake up and your hands are jittery, you don't know why. If you wake up and you don't get your coffee, you have a blinding headache, you're an addict. Are you free to eat desserts? Free to eat donuts and coffee and cakes and pies? Sure you are. And if you keep on doing that, you'll be free to gain weight and become unhealthy. Are you free to train for an Ironman triathlon? Of course you are. You're also free to get a variety of injuries as you do so. Because the human body is not designed to run 26 miles and then ride a bike 140 miles and then swim two and a half miles in the open seas. And you will hurt yourself. Are you free to do that? Of course you're free to do that. And you'll hurt yourself. There are many things we're free to do that are damaging. So what you have to do is follow the basic rule, is it beneficial, chapter 6, verse 12 and 13, and are you doing it to the glory of God, which means according to his plan. And his plan to do everything according to his instruction and for his glory is to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth in the context of marriage. And again, I'm going to say more about that tonight, so uh, very, very little more. The danger, I'm not going to talk about that anymore right now. I want to talk about something behind it all. What's behind it all is the teaching that the universe is a personal place. Now, there are two views of the universe, and one is the personal view, and the other is the impersonal view. And I brought a book along just because I like to bring books, and I like to wave them around. It's by the friendliest atheist in America today. And he is, his name is Jonathan Haidt, and he admires the church, and he admires Christianity, he loves theists, and he has lots of Christian friends, and he thinks it's wonderful, and they read books together, and they discuss together, and all of his books are full of comments about how useful Christianity is to society, and it's very sincere. He's a good man in a lot of ways. He has very dedicated Christian friends, and they study the Bible together, but he's not a Christian. In his book, which admires Christianity, called The Righteous Mind, Jonathan Haidt, his book offers a completely, this is not a critique, he says it's the goal of the book, it's not the only goal, but it's one of the goals, is to offer a completely atheistic, materialistic, evolutionistic explanation of morality. And he spends chapters on that. He does his best. And the thesis is, that the universe is impersonal all the way down. We're glad you believe in God because it makes you a better person, but you're wrong. Marriage is a delusion. 
You know why people get married? According to the atheist Darwinian, it's not an accusation. They're open about it. I'm not saying it's their secret. They say it overtly. Marriage is an institution that exists to keep males from fighting dangerously and to the death over females. Somebody came up with the idea that we got to stop killing each other while competing for mates, and they called it marriage. And, you know, human babies are born with really big heads. Have you noticed that? And, and human beings can't walk for a whole year. They're really very helpless. I have two very young grandchildren who are awfully close to totally helpless. And so it works so much better if you have a mate with you. And those socialized males who hung around their mate and around their baby survive more. Their babies survive more, and so their genes were passed on. And marriage is a delusion, love is a delusion, love songs are a delusion, and all the duties we passed on are delusion because the universe is impersonal all the way down and we can't stand it, so we make up stories about personalism. That's the secular person. And the Bible says the universe is personal all the way down. The Bible says marriage is not something that, that, that people came up with by accident and their children survive better. The Bible says God designed marriage in part to reflect who he is to this world. So in some ways, you know, there's different passages that show this. The one that you all know is husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church in Ephesians chapter 5. And that's a very important passage. But actually what I want to take you to is Hosea chapter 2, which God says this. He says to Israel, I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness, in justice, in love, and in compassion. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you will acknowledge the Lord. He's saying he's the real husband. Ephesians um, chapter 3, verse, Ephesians, uh, I can't say it all of a sudden. Ephesians 3, 14, I think, is the passage. All fatherhood in the earth is named after God, our heavenly father. Fatherhood is an echo of God the Father. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him, right? But it's not, God is not like parents. God's like a, not like a dad. Dads are like God. And husbands aren't really ultimately like Jesus. You know, Jesus isn't a husband like, like a good husband, like a better husband. Anybody who's a good husband is a Jesus-like husband. Jesus is the model. God created marriage to give us a model for marriage and for himself. And God created marriage so he could show us that he's faithful. And it's personal all the way down. This is what he's saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 13. He says this. He says, you all say, all things are lawful for me, um, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful and not be slave, enslaved by anything. That's 612, 613. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, Paul says, and God will destroy them both. Now what they mean by food is for the stomach and the stomach is for food is it's a, it's, it's a gentle way of saying if I'm hungry, I eat. If I'm thirsty, I drink. If I'm tired, I sleep. And if I have a sexual desire, I satisfy it wherever I satisfy it. And Paul says, it's not that simple. He says, and something seems very strange, he says, the body's not meant for, for uh, sorry, food is for the stomach and the stomach is for food, but God will destroy both one and the other. Now, we think to ourselves, how can God destroy food? We have the wedding feast of the lamb. What's going on here? And, and what I want to tell you is there are two words for our appetites in the Bible, for our stomach. The first word is stomachos. No st Sounds kind of like stomach, right? The first word is stomachos, and that's the, that's the instrument of digestion. And the second word is koilia, which means the belly or the womb or the seed of desire. So when you have, you know the Bible verse that says their God is their belly? You know that one? You know that Bible verse? Their God is their belly is koilia. Their God is their, is their appetites, their desire for whatever they want. Their desire to satisfy themselves. So... Paul says this, the belly, koilia, will be destroyed. Selfish desire will be destroyed, but the stomach will continue. 
And so we use our stomach the right way. We don't use it for endless appetite. This is the metaphor that he's using. And when he uses the word koilea, which can mean the belly, but it can also mean the womb or the desires from this, that you feel in this part of your body, he's using the, the exact term that the Corinthians need. We don't just indulge ourselves. The body's not for sexual immorality, verse 13. It is for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Don't you know your bodies are members of Christ, verse 15. Shall I take the members of Christ and unite them to a prostitute? My translation, no way. Don't you know that whoever is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? You can't just give your body to somebody. You have to give it within marriage, body, soul, mind, and strength. And so Paul says, flee from sexual immorality. Don't you know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? You're not your own. We're bought with a price. That is to say, it's personal all the way down. Eating is personal. Your sex life is personal. And it's personal because God is personal and because everything in this world ultimately has a personal flavor to it. And ultimately, our sexuality, which gives us reproduction and joy and union with our husband and wife, also points to the creative fruitfulness of God and the way it's set up to love each other through thick and thin, for better or for worse, is set up to teach us that God is faithful to the end. Marriage is not a man-made institution. It's God-made. And he made it to show us that the world is personal from the creation until the end. And that's how a good marriage, good parenting, reflects the glory of God.